Good morning out there world. I think I'm live on both. We're good. So welcome to the PT on Ice Daily Show, everybody. Happy Tuesday, Clinical Tuesday, that is. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Morgan Denny. I am the lead faculty for the primary care PT course, as well as created in teaching the um, management of the post-COVID patient online short course. So good morning, good day. Uh, if you don't know, there are so many ICE courses coming up. So before we get started, I just want to say, check out the website. I can't even begin to list them all. There are so many good things coming up, uh, including the new cohort of the primary care PT course just started yesterday. So if you're interested in joining that, it's not too late. Just sign yourself up. Anyway, that brings us to our topic today, which is thinking like a primary care PT. So. For those of you who don't know me, one of my main beliefs is that as PTs, we really need to step up in terms of our background medical knowledge, information on screening, and ability to kind of ask the right questions in order to get to the bottom of certain patients' diagnoses and also to be able to treat them much more holistically and therefore effectively. So I want to kind of talk you through some of my processing using a patient that I'm currently seeing and have been seeing for the last couple months. So we're going to call her Alicia. She is a 71 year old female. She came to me because she has a history of severe falls. So her falls have been occurring since she was 30, kind of young, right at a frequency of around three to four times per year. Now, when we say fall, I'm not talking like catch a toe and stumble. These are falls where she literally feels like she's an ironing board and falls over, or she has no idea what happens, but she finds herself on the ground. Kind of severe stuff going on. She's been checked out by a lot of people. No one really knows what's happening. Um, so she comes this time after a more recent fall that had been, I think, four weeks ago. Uh, she had fallen while walking, which is primarily how she always falls. And walking is her primary form of exercise, um, along with kind of the thing that she loves in life. Like she does it with friends, you know, it's social, it's activity, all the things. It gets her outside. So she was walking, and before she knew it, she suddenly was on the ground, had literally banged up the left side of her face, no scrapes on her hands, so maybe not really good reaction timing. Um, this became more concerning because even though she's been having these falls for years, in the last, I think it was last year, she had a bone scan that showed she was starting to become osteopenic. So she's really concerned that she's going to have fractures in the future if she keeps having these falls, especially after this recent one where she literally smashed her face a little bit. Um, now she's tried PT before a couple times. And she says like, you know, she's not sure if it helped, uh, nothing conclusive, but she never kept doing her exercises. Not shocking. When people don't see a big change, they're not going to keep doing what we ask them to. So, you know, keeping that in my mind, I'm like, all right, this may or may not be a standard case of PT, or it might be with a patient that didn't follow through or whose PT wasn't able to convince them that this was going to be the thing in the way. Now, this patient's past medical history only includes asthma, which I thought was really interesting. You know, a lot of people who are older and who come in with this history of falls tend to have more of a background, but she didn't. Her only thing was asthma, and the only other thing that I could peel out was that she had had a very mild concussion in her 20s, which she said was no big deal and she felt wasn't even relevant. But I just put that out there because sometimes these things come into play. Um, for her asthma also, it's pretty mild. She is, has been prescribed Montelukast, which is a common asthma drug, but she doesn't even take it because she doesn't feel she needs it. So just to throw that out there. <clears throat> now, I know to some of you you're thinking like, okay, this sounds kind of like a balanced vestibular case. Like how is this primary care PT? But I just encourage you to wait a second. Let me get through some of the nitty gritty. Um, and I think the reason that in my brain, I initially thought like, this is not quite a vestibular case, is that she's seen PT. 
like she's gone to these specialists who are vestibular care people. She's done a lot of these balance exercise and restorative stuff and strength training, and none of it seemed to change anything. Now, we can never hang our hat on that because we have no idea the level of care, right? It's not like I know who she saw and I know what they did, but at the same time, whenever I see someone who's seen PT multiple times before, it makes me pause and say, there could be more to this story, and I need to be even more aware of some of the other outside components. So my first mental take on this situation was this. Number one, what are my competing theories, right? Like what are the things that could be causing these falls? And then beyond that, thinking through the lens of, once I have those theories, these hypotheses, how can I either refute or confirm a higher level of suspicion there, right? Just like we do in ortho, it's kind of like you think, okay, I think this is hip OA. What are some tests I can do to confirm that it's hip OA versus deny or say it's probably something else, right? So I'm thinking about this, but in a different sense or not necessarily just in the orthopedic world. So for this patient, my competing theories or things that I was thinking about included some form of neurologic issue, right? Like if this patient is falling and can't really remember falling, doesn't know what happens, doesn't remember catching a toe, is she having some form of really infrequent seizure or another neurologic issue that causes her to black out when she's walking and then just hit the ground? No idea what's happening. And then my second thought is, okay, what about cardiac involvement? You know, a lot of times when the body is not getting adequate uh, blood flow to the brain, literally it just makes you pass out. Like that's what a lot of passing out is, is the body's like, I'm not getting blood flow in the brain. This is dangerous. We got to lay this person down so I don't have to work against gravity to push that blood flow up into the brain so I can save the neurologic system. Good call, body. Good call. So I was wondering about cardiac stuff. Maybe it was something in that realm. Now, from an orthopedic issue, of course there could be lots of causes. Like we all know a lot of people who only walk for exercise tend to be really weak, especially through their proximal musculature. What if it's that? What if she just doesn't have any reaction time and she is catching a toe? Maybe it's a vestibular thing. Maybe she really isn't able to just like balance or notice that she's off balance until she hits the ground. You know, and maybe, maybe it's a visual aspect. You know, you got to think with some of these people, like if they're just not seeing something, maybe they have no idea that they're catching a toe or tripping because they're like, there was nothing to trip on. I didn't feel any impact, you know? So I was thinking about all of these things and then thinking about from a neuro, cardiac, orthopedic, visual standpoint, how do I go through and do some testing? Like, how do I say with any certainty yes, this is probably something we need to pursue versus no, we can probably leave that off the table. It's unlikely. So those are my initial thoughts after hearing her subjective questioning. So the next question, right, is what tests can I do? Like, what can I complete? So day one, because you can't get everything done in one visit. Unfortunately, they always want you to. But for day one, I started out with cardiac, right? So we screened vitals. Always a really good start in my book. We looked at vitals at rest and everything was normal, like really, really normal. Blood pressure's in normal range, fairly resting heart rate, probably in the low 70s, which for someone sitting in a room kind of agitated talking about like their history of falls, not too bad. Um, and SpO2 was good, respiratory rate was fine. Now, what I had the patient do, because this is day one and we don't have all the time in the world, was do like some little orthopedic balance testing in the room. So we probably did two to three minutes of standing one foot, marching slowly, doing some sidestepping, kind of looking at lateral movement, seeing what these patients' balance reaction was and kind of like where that weakness comes in with some bigger functional movements. And then after I had her do those things, I rechecked vitals. Now, that day, vitals were really normal. Like everything increased a little bit to an appropriate level but I did notice that the patient was really short of breath for the amount of work that she was actually doing. When I asked her about this, the patient said, you know, um, it's my asthma and I'm having some really bad sinus allergy stuff right now. Okay, put that in my back pocket. You know, it's day one, let's move on. I'm not going to like blast into that because the patient is certain that's exactly what's going on. So in terms of cardiac, that's kind of where I left it day one. 
For neuro, after asking more questions and digging in, it turned out that the patient had actually seen a neurologist prior and they'd done a brain scan, MRI, I believe, and had found nothing and she had been fully assessed. So while I'm not willing to let that one go completely, I did again, like kind of put that away and put it on the shelf for the moment since she had been screened by a neurologist. Now, in terms of, terms of ortho, as we would assume, the patient was weak. So I did give her, you know, some general strength exercises for hips and core and some reaction timing stuff like the Clock Yourself app. And for those of you, if you've never used the Clock Yourself app, it is, it's awesome for people of all levels, but it's a great balance time, reaction time, speed training thing where you don't have to instruct people in a lot, but you just have them get the app online. So Clock Yourself, write that one down. Um, from a, let's see, from a balance aspect, she wasn't great, but she wasn't terrible either. She was kind of just average, like nothing really popping out along that line. And then last but not least, screening visual stuff. Did a full visual screen um, because the patient does wear glasses and she reported her prescription was pretty old. Everything came back pretty good except convergence. So literally having her, fo her follow my finger in towards her nose and keep that in focus. When I did convergence testing, she was all over the place, really couldn't follow. We tried it a handful of times. When I kind of explained that to her and I said, like, this is what I'm testing and this is how it relates to your functional life, she said that made a lot of sense to her and that she always feels like her depth perception is off. When I asked her to kind of explain that, and we kind of went through a bunch of different functional things, I found out that literally for the past seven or eight years, even though she lives at a third floor appoint or apartment, not appointment, she's been going up the stairs for exercise, but she avoids going down because she feels uncomfortable. So again, day one, I'm thinking, okay, this could be a player, not necessarily, but it definitely could be. So I kind of talked with her about some of the stuff we were finding and seeing. And I discussed with her kind of the potential for revisiting a neuro appointment, but not necessarily right off the bat, maybe doing a consult with a cardiologist just to see and potentially seeing an ophthalmologist or a neuro ophthalmologist to check on some of this visual stuff. Now, keep in mind, in the system right now, if you go and schedule with a specialist, at least in Portland, you're not going to see that person for two to four months. And hopefully it's better where you are, but not where I am. So I kind of talked about this with her day one, even though I didn't have all the information I wanted, because if she was going to get an appointment, it was not going to happen immediately. So we discussed it and I said, start thinking about it. Start thinking about reaching out to your primary care person to see if they have specific referrals they like or they prefer, which is something I always encourage patients to do unless they don't like their PCP. Because if they see a specialist that their PCP is good at communicating with or is understands how to communicate with and does it frequently, it's more, it's more common that people stay in the loop and that patient's care stays connected versus seeing someone sort of outside of the network that they're unfamiliar with, that they don't have a good communication network with. So I did encourage her day one to like think about that, you know, and think about like if that made sense to her and so we could follow up with questions. So... That was kind of day one. Um, and that was a lot, right? Like I'm lucky I have an hour for evals. So I got through a lot of things, but I just wanted to point out kind of like how I was thinking about it. Now, as we went on, so I saw, I've been seeing this patient for probably about three months now, and I see her at a frequency of once every two to three weeks, which is not optimal, but our clinic is busy. And for this patient, because there's so much going on, it's good to have that time in between for her to kind of like fully work on things, see if they're changing, fully assess what's happening, and also do some of the homework that we assign. So what I've noticed is that when we go into the gym, we do stuff like your general strength work, but we also do a lot of obstacle courses, which I think are wonderful, not just for training when you have an issue with balance, but also just for observing. So the things that I found in terms of observing this patient do obstacle courses is that she doesn't have, even when she stumbles, she doesn't have any loss of balance. Like she's able to kind of regain her balance. She definitely has some depth perception issues. So for example, if I'm stacking blocks up at different heights to have her step up and over, she often doesn't really perceive that they're a different height. 
she will catch a toe on said block. Or if it's lower than she thinks, she will overstep. You know, that feeling like when you're going up the steps and you think there's one more, so you step really high and come down way more sharply. She does that frequently, or she'll just catch a toe a little bit. She doesn't notice when the blocks are different heights. And I'll literally have her do the obstacle course, come back and look at it and say, what do you see? Do the blocks look different height? And when she looks, she can tell, but she hasn't noticed until I point it out. So that's been a big thing that we've worked on is just kind of like a visual perception and visual placement and kind of like how to screen her environment as she's moving through. Um, but another thing that's happened is that shortness of breath. So I mentioned that after doing a little activity in the room for evaluation day, she was seemingly short of breath for just doing a tiny bit of work. So when we're in the gym, what I've noticed is after she does five, 10 minutes of like loaded carries up and over the steps through obstacle courses, when she's breathing hard, I'm always kind of reassessing vitals. And what I found is that while her vitals are pretty good, at an initial point, once she's actually working harder and she's pretty short of breath, her SpO2 starts to tank. We're not talking tank like in the 60s, but we're talking going from 96 down to 89. Now, the other thing that happens is her heart rate doesn't increase until she stops working. So we're talking her heart rate might go from a resting 70 some beats per minute up to like 80 while she's working. She's significantly shorter breath. I have her stop, I check all her vitals. Her SpO2 is trash and her heart rate is just like in the 80s. Once she stops and her recovery can come into play, her heart rate will go up to about 110 as she recovers and her respiratory rate stays high and her oxygenation level does recover, but it takes some time. So that was another cue to me to really push for that cardiology consult. Additionally, I had auscultated her heart, so I'd listened to her heart sounds and basically had heard nothing crazy. If you've listened to a lot of heart sounds, like you can pull out some little nitty gritty, but for me at least, and I've listened to a lot of heart sounds, sometimes there's something off, right? Like you just have to get used to normal and there was something off. So between that strange off heart sound and some of the stuff I was seeing in the gym, I really pushed her to go and like get a cardiology visit. So, and some of you will ask like, why not pulmonology? Like, why not look at her breathing? And I'll tell you, honestly, the big things were, we trialed having her do, like use her inhaler when she felt short of breath. It didn't change anything. So in my mind, that puts the hypothesis of the asthma exacerbation or a pulmonary condition lower on my list. Number two, with that shortness of breath, while her respiratory rate goes up pretty fast to accommodate for the dropping oxygen saturation level, her heart rate is really the thing in my mind that's doing the inappropriate action. Like it's not going up enough to kind of acclimate and get the oxygen through the system fast enough. Also in auscultating her lungs, I found nothing. In looking at her chest cavity expansion and retraction, it seemed pretty normal. So for me, that puts like the pulmonary side lower on the list in this shortness of breath category and the cardiac side a little bit higher. So I went for that first. Um, so drum roll, just kidding. So basically her cardiologist had her do a halter monitor, right? So where you basically wear um, a heart monitor for anywhere between 48 hours to a week. Some people will do it a lot longer. Following that, it showed that she had an arrhythmia no further information on how significant, how frequent, how often, just literally her report from the patient said, you have an arrhythmia. Um, so following up with that, the doctor suggested a stress test. Great, let's do it. The patient found that she was unable to do it because they had her do it on a bike, which she's uncomfortable on and has knee pain. So she couldn't push hard enough. This is a common thing that happens. So be sure to ask if patients say this. And so one of the things actually on my to-do list is to call the cardiologist and encourage them to let her do it on the treadmill. Apparently she said something about passing out and they were like, you can't stand and do this. So we're, that the jury is kind of out on that one, right? So we're still thinking like potentially we've got a cardiac thing going on here. But on the other side of that, once the arrhythmia was discovered, her doctor did prescribe metoprolol, which is a common drug used for blood pressure control. And since then, 
while her respiratory rate stays high, her oxygen doesn't tank. I would consider that progress, right? So we're checking these things, making sure everything's working. Whenever someone has a new med on board, you always want to see what the change is. Like, is it affecting the system appropriately? Because that's, I mean, that's one of the roles as a primary care PT that I think we really need to play. And for this patient, because I was wondering, like, is that tanking in O2 something that's causing her to pass out and have these falls? I really want to make sure it's having that effect. And so far, so good. Now, she also went and saw an ophthalmologist because after a bit of testing and really seeing that that depth perception was a little bit off, um, I, was, I decided like that was probably a good idea. Also, she had a kind of like an off eye set, which can happen from concussions and a lot of other reasons, but I decided to send her. Her ophthalmologist actually believes she may have a rare form of macular degeneration and has sent her for different testing at a facility that has um, like higher level instruments. Now, for those of you who don't know, macular degeneration is where you have a degradation like in the back of the eye that causes you to lose your central vision. So we're talking like blind or patchy spots in the middle of your vision, not periphery. So with macular degeneration, potentially she is literally not able to see a height, dif a height difference. Maybe that's one of the things that's affecting her depth perception is that she's just not seeing something even if she's looking at it because it's obscured by this macular degeneration. So that to me is a key also, and they're pursuing further treatment along those lines once she gets this new testing done. Um, so in general, since I've been seeing her for a few months, patient has gotten stronger, like she's doing better. She's back to walking. She feels very confident. She has had one fall since I saw her, but it was not her common fall. It was a fall while she was intentionally walking on uneven bed of rocks <laughs> as her PT challenge, which I highly encouraged, but she was wearing um, shoes that didn't have tread and the rocks were wet. So she literally slipped, fell, didn't injure herself, but knew exactly why she fell. And the patient even told me she thought that was a huge advantage that she felt like it was under her control. It was something she was doing. She knew exactly why she fell, so it didn't scare her in the same way. So that's kind of where we're at. And I think it's it's good to point out, right, the jury is still out, right? I don't have this like stamp where I'm like, oh, it's definitely a heart thing or a neurology, you know, neurology thing or any of those. But right now, at least we're pursuing some different avenues that the patient hasn't known about that potentially could be affecting this rate of falls and this like strange level of falling where she's not able to put her hands out, doesn't know what's happening. So she's pretty happy. And in my mind, I think while sometimes we can put our finger on the cause directly, I think in medicine, we too often try to like do that. Like we have to find one thing when often it's just like a collaboration of a bunch of different stuff that's not playing nice together. So for now, like I'm pretty convinced that cardiology could be playing a role, visual aspects are playing a role, and certainly like balance reaction times and weakness always play a role. But in looking at this patient case, if all I had done was do strength training and balance and reaction timing, I'm sure she would feel a little bit stronger, but we may not have actually gotten after the reason behind her falls. So this is just a case I wanted to kind of explain and share and say, like, if we can all start thinking more holistically about patients and not just going along the PT route, because that's what we're really good at, you know, but get more information, get more training, understand how different systems in the body work together or can fail together for that matter, like it will make us better PTs and it'll make us better able to really help and serve our patients who have been through the medical system like this person and really not seen a lot of change because everyone just stays in their camp and can't see outside of that. So I hope that was helpful. I hope you all have a great day. Remember, it is not too late to jump into the current cohort of the primary care PT that just started yesterday, so you're not even behind at all. Um, and today's song of the day is called Super Bloom by Mr. Wives. All right, everybody, I hope you have a great day and all the good things in life. <laughs> Ta-ta.
Hey, thanks for tuning in to the PT on Ice Daily Show. If you enjoyed this content, head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. And be sure to check us out on Facebook and Instagram at the Institute of Clinical Excellence. If you're interested in getting plugged into more ICE content on a weekly basis while earning CEUs from home, check out our virtual ICE online mentorship program at ptonice.com. While you're there, sign up for our Hump Day Hustling newsletter for a free email every Wednesday morning with our top five research articles and social media posts that we think are worth reading. Head over to ptonice.com and scroll to the bottom of the page to sign up.